Whitehall, one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have for obvious reasons been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. I am Chief Richard Anderson of Scotland Yard. Murder with a gun is, is not common in Britain, but Anthony de Bruyne was shot to death. I would like you to see the evidence that led us eventually to the murderer. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson. And you're standing in Scotland Yard's Black Museum, of which I have the honor to be the custodian. Now, while we have certain extremely gruesome objects in these two rooms, many of them are quite innocuous when taken out of context. They are here not as ghoulish exhibits for the morbid, what are examples for study by our people in connection with their jobs? Now, such an exhibit is this one in case number 160277. Now, this is an ordinary cheap raincoat. Ah, that's the one. Identical with those worn by thousands of men. Identifying tags of all kinds have been removed. It was completely anonymous. Our people thought it might be an important clue to the identity of the murderer. It seemed impossible. But my good friend, Inspector Anderson here, followed this extremely tenuous clue to the end. Almost to the end, sir. What do you mean, Inspector? I wasn't present when they were hanged, sir. The crime. At 10 o'clock of the morning of April 3rd, 1947, Anthony de Brun, a young stockbroker's clerk, was walking with his fiancée toward Howard's Jewelry Shop in Charlotte Street near Tottenham Court Road in London. They were on their way to purchase an engagement ring. Or at least six carats, darling. Set in platinum, too. I wish I could afford it, really, though. Whatever it is, I'll love it, Anthony. <laughs> well, come on. Let's see what I can afford, shall we? Darling. Hey! What's that? Robbers! Out of the road, there you go! Out of the road! From Inspector Anderson's first notes on case 160277. Uh, robbers wore white cloth masks. Faces not seen by anyone at murder scene. Apparently young men. No jewelry taken. De Bruyne only casualty. Shot through head. NB, pathologist extracting bullet for examination. Gun not found. Apparently taken with him by murderer. Girl hysterical, unable to talk coherently. Witnesses to murder unable to identify. <laughs> murder and companion disappeared inside business building at number 14 Charlotte Street. Interview with Thomas Cobley, porter at number 14, by Detective Sergeant John Quinn of Scotland Yard. Oh, I've seen him all right, sir. See this knob on me head? One of them hit me with a bleeding great pistol as he ran past me, sir. After that, he tried to shoot me, but the thing wouldn't go off. Could you recognize either of them again, Cobbley? Well, that I could, sir. Both of them had their masks hanging about in their necks. I've seen their faces all right. I'd recognize the one with the mustache anyway, sir. I think. You know how they were dressed? Well, uh, uh, one of them had on a raincoat, sir. The other one, uh, uh, well, I'm afraid I don't remember, sir. But I'd know him again, sir. Interview with Police Constable Roy Harris on point duty near the rear entrance to number 14. Yes, Sergeant. Oh, it was them, all right, I'm sure. Two men answering to Cobbley's description came running out of the rear entrance at 10-7, Sergeant. I saw the one with the moustache. Would you recognize him again, Constable? Oh, I'm sure I would, Sergeant. However, I didn't notice the raincoat. In fact, I'm sure that neither of them wore one. But you would recognize them again, though? Positively, Sergeant. Raincoat or no raincoat. Inspector Anderson of Scotland Yard. We found the raincoat three hours later. It had been hastily tucked in a dark corner of the hallway at number 14, through which the men had apparently run. 
Yes, it was the same coat you saw in the Black Museum a few moments ago. The manufacturer's label had been removed, so had the label of the shop that had sold it. Contained no initials, no marks of any sort. A shabby, shapeless garment that might have been worn by anyone. In the right-hand side pocket was a caliber forty-five automatic pistol. The type used by the American Army. It had apparently been fired twice. A clip containing four ball cartridges was still in place, with an additional one in the chamber. I took it myself to Chief Inspector Carl Tree in the ballistic laboratory. Hey, uh, I had it checked, Anderson, for fingerprints. And? None, of course. Uh, let's use one of those shells. Tom, did you fill the catchment box with cotton wool? Yes, sir. All right, stand aside, Anderson. All right, Tom, get it out, will you, please? All right, sir. First time I've seen that, sir. Aye, right, they're sending us up the bullet they're taking out of this chap's head. Postmortem must be about finished. Then we'll put them both under the comparison microscope and see for certain if this is the gun they both came from. Quite. I I'll be waiting, sir. Aye. We'll let you know at once. By the next afternoon, the 4th April, we were certain this was the murder gun. Ergo, the raincoat had probably belonged to the murderer, the man with the moustache, who we had been assured could be readily recognized. If we could find him, that would be difficult. I put criminal records onto it. They produced some 150 dossiers of known criminals whose taste ran to robbing jewelry shops and or carrying guns. Further checks showed that the pistol had been stolen from a U.S. amphibious engineer regiment in June 1946. There was no clue to the thief, the American Army DCI informed us. The porter Cobbley remembered that the men had worn gloves. The constable said that he did not see the direction they had gone. They simply lost themselves in the crowd of passers-by. Quinn and I went over the anonymous raincoat again. I haven't been able to discover anything, sir. Uh, he's done a good job. Every single identification that's visible to the naked eye's been removed. How do you know? Well, I compared it with me own and Nobby Clark's and yours, sir. All the tags on this one are gone. I wonder if he removed things that aren't visible to the naked eye. You mean... Things you might find with ultraviolet or infrared light, sir? I was thinking of something else. What, sir? Get me a razor blade, Quinn. You, you're going to rip the coat apart? I was lucky. The first cut I made. The seam where the left sleeve was attached to the coat itself revealed a tiny stamped paper tag sewed inside the lining. It was a kind of manufacturer's stock tag. Photographs were quickly made, circulated to every manufacturer of raincoats in the country. That took a week, but a firm in Leeds identified it at once as one of theirs. The coats, they said, bearing that stock number, had been sold to shops in southeast London, either Deptford or Bermondsey. Well, thank heaven for forgers, Quinn, I said. That I don't get, sir. Look, A, people forge clothing coupons. Yes, sir. B, when you buy clothing at any store in London, the shopkeeper puts down the number of the coupon book, what you've bought, and your name. Why, oh, that's right, sir. Uh, go and find me the names of the people who bought these coats, Quinn, my lad. It wasn't quite as simple as all that. Uh, but it wasn't so hard either. There had been 24 dozen of that lot of raincoats sold in those two districts, and we accounted for all but six of them. Inspector Anderson and I went over the list of 282 names. We found not one name we'd ever heard of, and criminal records reported that none of them were known in their files. Well, it was a good try, sir, I said to Inspector Anderson. Well, we still haven't checked on each of these names personally. Uh, we'll have to do it, sir, I expect. Quite. Well, gird up your loins, Quinn. Sir, they're right up under me chin now. I was just thinking of something. Sir? Got your own book of clothing coupons on you? Yes, sir. Let's see them, will you? Yes, sir. Sign? Sign it myself, sir. Hmm. Hmm. What's the matter, sir? What's your name? Hey, John Quinn. You know that, sir. This is signed Quinn John. Well, by crikey. And mine is signed Anderson Richard. Let's look at this list again, the hind end, too. Yes, sir. 
Clancy Oliver. That'd be Oliver Clancy. Gold Joseph. Ever heard of Joe Gold? Johnston John. No, John Johnson. She and Robert. No one could be named She and Robert. We're right, old boy. Freeman George. George Freeman. Mullen Fry. Crikey, I remember that name. So do I, sir. But he died last month. Yes, sir. A smash and grab feller. A uh, real white boy. I remember. Killed in a bus accident in Clarkenwell. He must have bequeathed the coat to somebody, mustn't he? Hmm. You know, I I seem to remember he, he had a kid brother in Borstal, sir. Check up and see if he's still there. If he's been let out, I shall very much want to talk with young Mr. Freeman. <laughs> In the room in Clarkenwell where George Freeman had lived prior to his untimely death, Sergeant Quinn found the younger brother, Arthur, who had been released from a Borstal reformatory only a few weeks before. He was quite willing to accompany the sergeant to Scotland Yard, where Inspector Anderson interviewed him. Sit down, Freeman. Don't mind if I do. Um, we found your raincoat, Freeman. Did you? Yes. I read it. What? Oh, I'll lend it to a fella. Who? <laughs> oh, I'm not a copper's mark, Mr. Inspector. You, um, you lent it to someone, then? Yes. Listen, uh, what do you want of me? We want some people to see you. What about? Oh, a little affair up Tottenham Court Roadway. Oh, uh, that fellow got murdered. Right. Well... Who wants to see me? I should think you could guess. Oh, do no good. I wasn't there. That you can prove, no doubt. Oh, I've got an alibi. I'd be glad to hear about it. I'll tell you when the time comes. I've got it all right. I expected you would have one. How did you know it was my raincoat? It was your brother's, wasn't it? But pretty smart. Thank you. But not as smart as you think, Mr. Inspector. Have you any objection to appearing as an identification parade? Me? Uh, other people going to appear with me? Of course. Same size as me? Mm -hmm. Same build? Mm -hmm. uh, so forth? Naturally. Well, uh, if you're afraid you'll be identified, Freeman... Nobody will identify me. Well, in that case, I shouldn't think you'd object. I'm not objecting. Well, then. Oh, I just don't want to be framed. You needn't worry about that. Oh, oh. Take it or leave it, Freeman. It's you in... Tails, I'll lose, eh? If I won't do it, you'll lock me up and... Uh... I'll arrest you on very definite suspicion, yes. And if I do, you'll contrive some way to point me out to the... Look here, Freeman, I'm trying to be fair. Oh. I won't even go in the room where they're having the identification parade. Huh? You'll leave me go as soon as it's over? If you're not identified, yes. Nobody will identify me. All right. All right, then. Oh, I'm not afraid. Sergeant Quinn. Yes, sir. Quinn, this gentleman's for the identification parade. Will you show him the way, please? Oh, yes, sir. Well, will you come with me, please, sir? Lead the way, my good man. Thank you. You want to know uh, who I'll let that raincoat to? I'd be most interested. I'll tell you what I'll do. I got an idea that raincoat was found somewhere near that Charlotte Street place. Is that right? Was it? Yes. Huh? You'd like to know who it was that lost it, eh? I'm not going to bargain with you, Freeman. <laughs> I just want to be bloody sure I'm not being framed. When I walk out of that identification parade without being fingered by anybody... Then I'll tell you who I'll lend it to. Thank you. Uh, uh, are you ready, sir? In a moment, my good man. That's a promise. I wasn't there. Perhaps he was. Freeman was not identified by anybody. True, only two persons, the constable and the porter, had seen the killers without their masks. But neither was able to point out any person in the lineup at all. 
Freeman in high glee returned to my room. Come on, let the rank too. He's Charlie Mortimer. Within the hour, criminal records had supplied us with details of Charles Mortimer, whose record showed he had served two terms at Dartmoor for armed robbery. Two detective constables were sent at once to his last address of record. Mr. Mortimer was not at home, but in his room were found three Patek Philippe watches. They were at once identified as part of the loot from a jewelry shop robbery at Queensway in Bayswater a few days before the one in which the man de Bruin was killed. Well, I said to Sergeant Quinn, our friend Mortimer may not be the murderer we want, but he'll have some explaining to do. Why don't you think he's the murderer? I didn't say that. I said he may not be the murderer. Well, sir, if he had the raincoat... If? Yes, sir. I've seldom heard of people like Freeman implicating others in murder. Except for a reason. To get even is the phrase. Ah, there's another thing. If Mortimer was in on the jewelry shop job in Bayswater... As he obviously was. At least he had those three watches. Well, if he was... Why should he try armed robbery again two days later, sir? That's a very important point, Quinn. I think so. Well, when we find Mortimer, we'll have a lot of questions to ask. We'll find him. Excuse me. Inspector Anderson here. Oh, hello, Thomas. You have? Good. Where? We found him. Mortimer? Yes. Hello, uh, Thomas. Where is he now? Oh, here. Well, send him in. I'll go get him, sir. Good. Quinn's coming to fetch him. Uh, did he talk? Didn't ask him any questions, eh? <laughs> Good. Let him think it's the Bayswater job he's been nabbed for. Right. And may I say that's very fine, quick work? Quinn will be there any second. Quite. Bye, old boy. Hello, uh, uh, Inspector Anderson again. Will you ring George and ask him how soon he can get those people together again? The people that attended the identification parade this morning. The ones on the Charlotte Street murder case. Uh, what's the number? Um, 160277. Thank you. Ask him to let me know as soon as he can, will you? Thank you. <laughs> what is it the Americans say? We're in business. <laughs> Ah, Sergeant Quinn. This is Mortimer, sir. Go on in. You may sit down, Mortimer. Sit down, Quinn. Thank you, sir. Has he been charged? Yes, sir. Accessory to armed robbery. Warned, of course. Anything I say may be taken down in writing and used as evidence. Ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lies. Uh, let me ask you one, Mortimer. Where's your raincoat? Out there at the desk. I mean the one you borrowed. What did I borrow one for? I've got one. I thought you borrowed one from Arthur Freeman. From Artie Freeman? Now, look here, mister. Artie Freeman's been looking for me ever since I... Uh, ever since that jewelry shop job in Bayswater that your bloody coppers pulled me in for. Do you think he'd lend me anything? Why is Artie Freeman looking for you, Mortimer? He's promised to cut me throat the minute he sees me. This is how Charles Mortimer explained that somewhat astonishing statement. It was on the day that Arthur Freeman was released from a Boston institution where, as a juvenile delinquent, he had served a long sentence. A friend of his, a certain Basil Green, another ex Boston boy, and Charles Mortimer had arranged a welcome home party for Arthur at a pub in Clerkenwell. It was quite a party, Mortimer said. After the other guests had departed, Arthur Freeman and Charles Mortimer sat at a table together and talked. The third man, Green, was asleep on the floor. Welcome home again, Artie, old boy. Welcome home to you, Charlie. Very happy returns. That's right. You drink. Yeah, I'll feel. You. I got to have some money. Well, I got two half crowns. More than that. I ain't got no more. Maybe Basil's got some. Hey, Basil... Why am I? He's asleep. There he is. Take your foot off his face. Why? Got to be polite. I'm flat. I need money. I'm stony. Let's go get some. All right. You know where? 
I know jewelry shop. Let's go rob it. That's what I mean. Take Basil with us. He's got a gun. I ain't got a gun. I'll borrow Basil's. Where's this jewelry establishment? Huh? Bayswater. Queensway Bayswater. <laughs> Listen, uh, you double cross me, I cut your heart out. Oh, I ain't gonna double cross you. Better not. I slit your throat, boy. Just don't worry about your pal Charlie Morton, old boy. <laughs> uh, when we do it? What? Rob jewelry shop, kill people in shop, get jewels. I got the place all figured out, encasing it. Taking sides. That's right. When we all do it? Tomorrow. Oh, listen. Uh, oh, oh let's... Let go. Listen, uh, I'm not kidding about this, Charlie. I ain't had a sixpence of my own for so long. Not a bloody farthing. I gotta have money. Let go! And if I have to kill somebody to get it, that's all right, too. If I gotta kill to get money, I'm the lad that'll do it. Look at me, Charlie. No, I don't care who I kill. And that goes for you, too, if you cross me up. I'm not you understand? To think I'm a crook? Meet me and Basil tomorrow morning at eight o'clock on the down platform at Bayswater. Water. I'll bring Basil's gun. We're gonna be rich, Clark. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was the way the first robbery began. The first association of Arthur Freeman, Basil Green, and Charles Mortimer. The affair was quite successful from their standpoint, and the three men separated, Mortimer carrying the loot. Mortimer went directly to a receiver of stolen goods and disposed of all but the three watches we found in his lodgings. Thoroughly dishonest crook. The rage of Arthur Freeman was terrible to behold when he came to Mortimer's deserted lodgings and found only the three watchmen's watches, Mortimer told us. He told us more. I heard from Basil Green that he raged. Simply raged, sir. Cut me throat from ear to ear, he said. Cut me up in little pieces and feed them to me, he promised. I was fair upset. Gentlemen, I never killed nobody. I knowed he'd do what he said because I know the knife he carries. I'll be safe in prison, won't I? Won't I? I'm bloody weary of dodging Artie Freeman. I was just on my way to a boat for South America when your Scotland Yard gentleman picked me up. You saw the tickets. Inspector Anderson sent me to pick up Basil Green and Arthur Freeman. I found Green easily enough, but our chief suspect, Freeman, had disappeared. At an identification parade, Green was quickly identified by those present at the Charlotte Street murder. No one even looked at Mortimer. Green was placed under arrest for complicity in the latter case. Mortimer was tried and convicted for the Bayswater robbery. Green, a rather simple-minded young spiv, decided to make a statement. Yes, sir, my own free will in the court. <laughs> Yes, sir, I understand what I say will be used in evidence. Go ahead, Green. Well, sir, will I start? Wherever you like. <clears throat> well, sir, I, I was asleep when they planned it. Do you mean when Mortimer and Freeman planned the first robbery? Huh? Yes, sir, that's what I mean. <laughs> Artie and me and Charlie went to Bayswater and we did that thing. Do you mean the robbery? Huh? Yes, sir, that's what I mean. Charlie took the stuff we got, and when Artie and me went to find him, he was gone. You know about that, sir. And then Artie got awful mad, and he cursed, and he... What What did he say? Well, I couldn't repeat that, sir. There, there's a lady present. And Miss Bellamy will hold her ears. Yes, sir. Well, he threatened Charlie and said he'd cut off Charlie's bloody ears and cut his throat and stab him and murder him. And that is Charles <laughs> Mortimer you're referring to, huh? Huh? Yes, sir, that's what I mean. Joe, Jenny said we had to have some money right away. You're now referring to Arthur Freeman? Huh? Yes, sir, that, that's what I mean. He said he wouldn't give me my gun back, and we'd go and stick up another jewelry store right away, and I told him I knew a little about this place in Charlotte Street, and he said, all right, let's go. We went and looked at it, and the next morning we did it. Uh, what'll I say now, sir? Whatever you like. Well, sir. We had those masks on we used at Bayswater. As soon as we went in the place, somebody shouted and... Somebody must have pressed a buzzer or something. Artie yelled out. Uh, he cursed, sir. And we run out, 
And there was this man, this De Bruyne, or whatever his name was. He, he was just coming in the door, and he said, Stop, and Artie cursed again and shot the man, and we ran. Now, masks was falling down, and we hit a band in the other building. We run right through it and out the back, and Artie took off his raincoat. It used to be his brother George's. He was a very nice fellow. You are now referring to George Freeman as a nice fellow. Huh? Yes, sir, that's who I mean. Artie wasn't. Isn't, I mean. Well, Artie swore at the raincoat and said he could be identified by it and threw it away. That's the way it was, sir. Your statement will be given to you after it's typed. What for, sir? For you to read and sign. Sir, I can't read very good. Well, I know where you can find Artie if you want him, sir. You, you know where he is? Yes, sir. You'll die when I tell you, sir. <laughs> Should I tell you, sir? If, if you like, Green. Well, sir, he's in jail. And there he was in Brixton jail. We hastened there and the warder took us down to the cell block where after a long walk we finally found our man. He grinned through the bars at me. Hello, Inspector. Hello, Freeman. How'd you find me? Your friend Basil Green told us. I'll kill him for that. I doubt it. What are you in for, Freeman? Hey, well, I broke a policeman's jaw. I thought they'd send me up for a while for that. By the way, my name's William Patterson in here. Good place to hide out. Not good enough. I got a little bothered about you, you see. Obviously. You found Charlie Mortimer? Yes. And he talked. At great length. Just as Basil Green did. Unlucky for me. Oh, no. We came to get you out of here. Oh, yeah. And take you elsewhere. Arthur Freeman, I arrest you on a charge of willful murder. I warn you that anything you, you say will say be taken, taken down, down in writing and may be used in evidence. evidence. Unlock the door, please, Water. At the trial at Old Bailey, both Arthur Freeman and Basil Green were found guilty of the murder of Anthony de Brune and were sentenced to be hanged. The sentence was duly carried out. You have heard another in the series Whitehall 1212, compiled by special permission from the Spiles of Scotland Yard. Only the names have been changed. Research for Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. This evening, Whitaker Chambers comes to the NBC microphone to read a letter to his children. Now, this is not an ordinary letter. This letter means as much to you, the American citizen, as it does to Mr. Chambers' closest relatives. This letter brings you the true nature of communism, its political implication to you as a citizen of the world, more particularly of the United States of America. Now, this evening, Mr. Chambers will tell you why he chose communism what he thought it would mean to him, politically and personally. That's A Letter to His Children, by Whitaker Chambers. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. 